Okay, in the last lecture we have seen uh, a boundary value problem uh, using uh, the formal finite element procedure in conjunction with uh, Rayleigh Gridge method and uh, also Galarkin method. And uh, the general steps involved in finite element procedure are first uh, uh, discretization of the problem domain and the derivation of element equations and then assembly of global equations. After that uh, introduction of essential boundary conditions and then solution of uh, global equations for uh, the nodal values or nodal parameters and then uh, substituting these nodal values or no nodal parameters into each of the element equations. You can calculate uh, uh, at element level, what are the uh, solutions, what are the solutions at element level. So, this is general finite element procedure and we have seen whatever we have seen so far is all uh, mathematical examples. We have taken a, a boundary value problem, uh, the physical phenomena of which uh, we are not aware of. Uh, so, uh, it is time for us to start looking at some physical applications. So, for that I have taken simple um, example axial deformation of a bar and here for generality uh, the cross sectional area of bar is taken to be varying and uh, uh, as indicated in the figure uh, the x axis is measured from the uh, right side at x, x is equal to 0 will be equal to 0 at uh, uh, sorry uh, at x is equal to 0 will be 0 at uh, left side and uh, x is equal to uh, L at uh, the right side. At right side there is a point load applied F and a distributed load is uh, uh, over the entire length of the bar and the material property and cross sectional areas are also assumed to be a function of x. So, so this is all for general case if you have a specific case of a bar which is having uniform cross sectional area uh, and material properties are constant over the entire length of the bar, then you can easily incorporate those kind of things uh, into the equations that we are going to derive. And uh, we need to now, uh, if you want to apply finite element method, uh, what you need to do is you need to uh, explain this physical phenomena that is axial deformation of a bar. Uh, in terms of a mathematical equation uh, that is uh, uh, what we require to solve uh, using finite element method in conjunction with variational method or Galarkin method. So, here what we will do is uh, to derive the governing differential equation for uh, explaining the physical phenomena of axial deformation of a bar. The first step is uh, you just take a small differential element out of this bar and uh, indicate all the forces that are acting on that uh, differential element. And then uh, sum up uh, the forces in the x direction, uh, you want this, uh, e uh, this differential element d x to be in equilibrium that means sum of all forces in x direction, because this is a 1 d problem you have only in the x direction, sum of all forces in the x direction equal to 0, you apply that condition that uh, gives us uh, uh, this equation which we can rearrange uh, that is f and f as a function of x uh, cancels with uh, minus f as a function of x and we will be left with this one after rearrangement. And we know that force is nothing but uh, it is for 1 d problem it is uh, stress times uh, cross sectional area and stress is uh, uh, equal to strain times uh, Young's modulus and strain is equal to derivative of displacement. This is all what you have learned from your mechanics of materials. So, we will apply all those conditions here. So, if ac, uh, sigma x is uh, the axial stress in the bar, then force f x is going to be sigma times cross sectional area. Everything is uh, for generality, everything is assumed to be function of x. Uh, so, according to the stress strain law, uh, sigma stress is equal to Young's modulus times strain and uh, here is the capital E is Young's modulus and uh, epsilon is axial strain. 
again all our functions of x. So, substituting all these quantities the given uh, uh, or the whatever equation that we obtained earlier that can be rewritten that is replacing f with e times area of cross section times derivative of e with respect to x. So, that is what is done here. So, this is the governing differential equation explaining the phenomena of axial deformation of a bar uh, and this is valid over the length uh, x going from 0 to l, uh, because that is the region we have taken for derivation of this differential equation. And now, uh, if you see uh, this is a second order differential equation and uh, uh, you require uh, two boundary condition uh, to solve this equation. So, the two boundary conditions uh, we need to look at the, uh, the problem that is uh, the problem that we are already looking at and we need to write the corresponding uh, boundary conditions. So, the first boundary condition is I mentioned to you the bar is fixed at the uh, left side that is at x is equal to 0 displacement is equal to 0 that is the first boundary condition at x is equal to 0 u is equal to u evaluated at x is equal to 0 is 0 and a point load is applied a point load of magnitude f is applied at x is equal to l. Uh, you just learned that f is nothing but area of cross section times uh, Young's modulus times uh, derivative of uh, u with respect to x. All these quantities we need to evaluate at x is equal to l in case uh, they are all functions of x. So, when all these quantities that is e times a times d u d x all are evaluated at x is equal to l, they must be equal to the uh, f uh, the point load that is applied. So, this is the other boundary condition. So, looking at the physics of the problem we have written the two boundary condition one is uh, uh, u evaluated at x is equal to 0 is 0 the other boundary condition is the point load applied at x is equal to l is equal to the value f. So, if you look at these two boundary conditions you can easily recognize one of them is essential the other one is natural boundary condition from the thumb rule that I already uh, mentioned to you in the earlier lectures that is if you have a boundary value value problem of order 2 p those boundary conditions of order 0 to p minus 1 are essential boundary conditions and those boundary conditions of order p 2 2 p minus 1 are natural boundary conditions. And also if you see the physics of the problem u evaluated at x is equal to 0 is uh, it is essential otherwise uh, if this boundary condition is not satisfied then it is not uh, uh, in fact it is not uh, a bar uh, problem. So, it is uh, uh, in fact it is essential uh, that this boundary condition you need to satisfy whereas, the other boundary condition even if a force f is not applied at uh, the uh, right tip then still a bar will be there. So, that is why it is called uh, natural boundary condition. So, now uh, we have uh, the physics of the problem the physical phenomenon is already expressed in terms of differential equation and that is where we can start our knowledge that we gained already from the previous lectures that is either you we can use variational method or Galarkin method and we can substitute finite element approximations into it and solve for the unknown quantities. So, here Now, we can uh, uh, write uh, following the here what I mentioned uh, uh, u evaluated at x is equal to 0 is uh, 0 that is uh, essential and the other boundary condition is natural boundary condition. And now, uh, we can use our uh, knowledge in variational method Rayleigh Gridge method and we can write directly the equivalent uh, variational functional for this problem and that is uh, you need to take the given differential equation. If you want to follow variational procedure uh, you just recall the steps involved take the differential given the differential equation multiply with variation of the quantity that you are looking for that is variation of u and integrate over the problem domain equate it to 0 and then the next step is apply integration by parts reduce uh, the higher order derivative terms and then uh, you need to substitute. Uh, uh, the condition that uh, variation of uh, u uh, wherever essential boundary condition is prescribed at that point variation of u is equal to 0 
and also uh, at this point you can also substitute uh, any natural boundary condition that is given and then uh, simplify it and bring it uh, use the variational identities and bring it into the form variation of some quantity is equal to 0 and whatever is there inside the bracket is what is called variational uh, uh, functional or equivalent variational functional and it turns out for this problem that is axial deformation of a bar this variational functional is nothing but potential energy and uh, that is why here it is denoted using capital pi and if so if you are good in uh, writing directly uh, the potential energy equation uh, for our potential energy expression for uh, a structural system you can directly write it here potential energy is nothing but strain energy minus work done by the applied forces and if you if you look at this uh, potential energy equation the first term is nothing but strain energy if you recall from your mechanics of material for a bar a problem uh, bar under axial deformation strain energy is nothing but uh, uh, sigma square over 2 e times volume and because uh, uh, if uh, all are constant that is area of cross section is constant and if uh, Young's modulus is constant if sigma is uh, also uh, constant you can apply this uh, condition but here all are assumed to be varying over the cross section uh, entire length of the bar so it is uh, 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 given as uh, uh, in the uh, here in the equation that is strain energy is equal to integral 0 to l half e times a u, u prime square that is nothing but derivative of u with respect to x if you, you can easily show whatever is there half e times a u prime square is nothing but sigma square over 2 e times volume uh, sorry uh, a, a, a times d x is volume and uh, uh, half times e u prime square is what is uh, sigma square over e. So, if you integrate over the volume you will get the entire strain energy and if you uh, recall what is work done by the applied uh, forces it is nothing but uh, uh, force times displacement since q is distributed uh, load. So, it is we need to uh, use integral integral 0 to l q is a function of x even though it is not explicitly written there q times u gives you the force and you need to integrate over the entire length of the bar f is a point load and the displacement evaluated at x is equal to l f times displacement evaluated at x is equal to l gives you what is the work done by the uh, due to uh, the application of load f. So, uh, if you are good at writing uh, potential energy expression directly you can do it or you can go start with the given differential equation and apply uh, the whatever procedure we learned for variational method or Graalic ridge method follow that procedure and finally, you will arrive at this equivalent variational functional. So, now we are ready to substitute if we know finite element approximation now we can substitute finite element approximation of u and uh, apply the stationarity conditions that we already did in the last class and get the element equations for this problem. So, now uh, the finite, uh, finite element equations can be derived uh, either you can use Galarkin method or variational method and here a typical element is shown uh, and here uh, this element uh, for this element uh, at the nodes 1 and 2 uh, point forces are shown f 1 and f 2 and also uh, the sign convention uh, please uh, see the forces are positive in the direction in which x is positive and uh, the nodal uh, coordinate of node 1 is x 1 nodal coordinate of uh, node 2 is x 2 and uh, q is the uh, distributed load that is acting and E a is constant the degrees of freedom associated associated with node 1 is u 1 uh, degree of freedom associated with node 2 is u 2 and length of this uh, typical element is L. So, now uh, if you see uh, this uh, uh, element actually you have two point loads applied. So, uh, if you want to write potential energy functional or equivalent variational functional it looks like this additional to if you see if you compare this equation 
with the previous equation that you got uh, for uh, the bar which is fixed at one end, you have only one f times u there, one f times u term there, whereas here you have f 1 times u 1, f 2 times u 2, because uh, you have point loads applied at the both ends uh, at uh, uh, one end 2, uh, because of that reason you have f 1 u 1, f 2 u 2, two terms are there and the rest of the portion is similar to what you already uh, have. So, now uh, what we can do is uh, we can uh, uh, this x 1 x 2 coordinate system we can map into s coordinate system or x coordinate system can be mapped into s coordinate system such a way that x 1 coincides with s is equal to minus 1, x 2 coincides with s is equal to 1. So, uh, in the last class, we have seen what is the relation between such kind of mapping between x coordinate system and s coordinate system, which you can obtain easily using uh, um, linear interpolation or a, uh, uh, there is a similarity between the, that uh, relation and equation of the straight line. I already explained the all these things in the last lecture. So, now uh, applying those uh, things you get the relation between s coordinate system and x coordinate system. Once again s coordinate system is defined such a way that s is equal to minus 1 coincides with x 1, s is equal to 1 coincides with x 2. So, the relation between x coordinate system and s coordinate system is this. The advantage of doing this kind of mapping is uh, the limits of integration now becomes minus 1 to 1 instead of x 1 to x 2. So, we can easily apply Gaussian quadrature and now using this relation we can uh, manipulate uh, and get the inverse relation between x coordinate system and s coordinate system and also we can take derivative on both sides we get this relations. And now uh, we need to write a trial solution in terms of s coordinate system. So, now uh, the entire uh, thing entire problem we are going to work in s coordinate system. So, trial solution is u is equal to n 1 u 1 plus n 2 u 2 and the shear function uh, n 1 n 2 are uh, already explained these things in the last class n 1 is equal to minus 1 uh, 1 minus s over 2 n 2 is equal to 1 plus s over 2 and uh, th this can be compactly written the trial solution can be compact compactly written as n transpose d and from there it follows what is u prime, u prime is nothing but derivative of u with respect to x using chain rule you can write derivative of u with respect to s, derivative of s with respect to x. You know what is the relation between uh, derivative of uh, uh, r relation between s and s, uh, x coordinate system. So, you can write what is a d s over d x, d s over d x turns out to be 2 over l and uh, uh, d u over d s uh, you can use the, uh, the first equation and get what is d u over d s. So, u prime turns out to be uh, what is that b transpose d, uh, where b transpose is uh, defined as 2 over l minus half half. So, that is what is defined as b transpose and please note that this notation is uh, 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 only applicable or uh, is applicable for all the uh, later lectures in this course and the notation depends on the author. Each author will have a different way of uh, using different notations. So, you should be careful when you are uh, referring uh, various textbooks. And now, uh, what is derivative of uh, shape function with respect to x? What is derivative of shape function n 1 with respect to x, shape function n 2 with respect to x? That uh, uh, you can easily write it uh, from the earlier uh, your knowledge, uh, we have seen uh, n 1 is equal to x 2 minus x over l, that is n 1. And so, you take derivative of it, you will get minus 1 over l. Uh, n 2 is nothing but minus x 1 plus x over l and if you take derivative of it you will get 1 over l uh, and if you sum up this uh, derivatives of n 1 and 2 it turns out to be 0 
and also shape functions that is n 1 plus n 2 is equal to 1 that is uh, sum of shape functions is equal to 1 and derivative of shape functions is equal to 0. Uh, this is uh, valid at any point in the domain and these are called consistency conditions. And the, now, you got trial solution and what is the derivative u prime derivative of u with respect to x. So, now if you uh, re, uh, see our uh, uh, potential energy equation, uh, we have u prime square and please note that u prime is a scalar quantity. So, u prime square I can write it as u prime transpose u prime. If you have a scalar quantity, scalar a square of a square, a scalar quantity can be written as uh, transpose of that scalar quantity times uh, that scalar quantity. So, using that reason u prime uh, square is written as u prime transpose times u prime and you know what is u prime? It is b transpose d and substituting all those quantities you get u prime square as given here. And now you got u prime square. So, you substitute u prime square and also uh, you, you can substitute what is u, u is n transpose d and finally, the given functional uh, uh, can be written in terms of finite element approximation in this manner, which you can further simplify. So, the first integral inside whatever is there first integral, if you see uh, the first integral term can be rewritten in this manner. And please note that uh, u 1, u 2 are nodal values or nodal parameters. So, they are not functions of uh, uh, the coordinate system. So, you can pull them out of the integral and whatever is left inside the integral that is half, uh, half is also constant. You can pull out of that, uh, pull that also out of the integral. What are, whatever is function of x, e is a function of x or s, a is function of s, l square. 1 minus 1 minus 1 1 times uh, L over 2 d s that is what is defined as k. And if you carry out integration you get uh, this one E a over L uh, 1 minus 1 minus 1 1 and this E a while carrying out this integration it is assumed E a are constant. So, we can take them out of the integral. So, whatever is given here k is equal to E a over L 1 minus 1 minus 1 uh, 1 that is applicable only when Young's modulus and cross sectional area are constant and that is a specific case and if you have a general case you need to integrate them uh, pu putting them inside the integral and k is defined like this. R q, R q is uh, defined like this, the second term is defined as R q and uh, here uh, if you uh, see the second term, second term actually it has n transpose d, d is taken out, d consists of u 1, u 2, it is taken out of the integral and whatever is remaining that is defined as R q and we can carry out the integration and finally, we will get q l over 2 q l over 2 and if you see last two terms you have f 1 u 1 times f 2 u 2 uh, f 1 u 1 and f 2 u 2 these terms are there the last uh, uh, term and in that you can again put them uh, in the form uh, of this vector f 1 f 2 times uh, uh, d vector. So, uh, r beta is defined like this. So, once we define k r q r beta, we can write the potential energy in a compact form like this. And now, you can see potential energy is a function of u 1 u 2 and the requirement is variation of potential energy should be equal to 0 or the other condition is you can uh, variation of potential energy is equal to 0 is satisfied when partial derivative of potential energy with respect to each of the nodal unknowns or nodal values is equal to 0. That is partial derivative of pi with respect to u 1 is equal to 0, 
partial derivative of pi with respect to u 2 is equal to 0, you get two equations. This is the first equation applying the first condition and the second condition. As you can see here, uh, whatever the uh, procedures you have learnt, uh, we are now applying to a physical problem. You can see the applications of those things that is the stationary conditions. And now you got two equations. These two equations can be are looking similar, so we can put these two equations in a matrix form. In this manner, and if you see one zero zero one is identity matrix, so whatever you multiply with the identity matrix, you get the same thing. So this can be compactly written. k value is substituted, k is equal to E a over L 1 minus 1 minus 1 1 that is what k and r beta and r q values, r q is nothing but q l over 2 q l over 2 r beta is f 1 f 2. And if you see this equation and uh, the first matrix is what is called stiffness matrix u 1 u 2 is displacement vector and whatever you have on the uh, right hand side, they are all related to forces and if there is no body force or distributed force q, then that vector is going to be 0 and if you have only point forces, then uh, you will have only f 1, f 2. And uh, you solving that equation system, you can get what is u 1, u 2, once you get a, uh, uh, that is for one element you need to assemble such kind of equations for all elements in the system and assemble the global equation system and apply the boundary condition, essential boundary condition, solve for the global equation system. Once you get the nodal values, you get you can go back to each element and then find strain in each element. Strain is given by B transpose D, strain is nothing but derivative of U with respect to X. You already know what is derivative of U with respect to X, B transpose D. B transpose is defined as 2 over L minus half half times D, D is nothing but U 1 U 2. So, strain you can obtain using this equation, once you solve for U 1 U 2, once you know the values of U 1 U 2, you can calculate the strain in the element using this relation and once you know the strain, you can find what is stress and axial force. And now, uh, we will take an example and apply uh, whatever we learned till now related to the uh, axial deformation of a bar. So, let us take a stepped bar like this, which is having uh, different, different cross sectional areas uh, over its length and the cross sectional areas, uh, the value of cross sectional areas and also the lengths over which those cross sectional areas are valid and also the material property and the load applied, everything is given here. And uh, since uh, bar is having a, a different, uh, is having different cross sections at a particular point, we will take uh, element 1 or uh, node 1 coinciding with the lower end node 2 coinciding uh, at the point, at the location at which the cross sectional areas are changing and node 3 is at uh, uh, the point where load is applied. And let us call uh, the element connecting nodes 1 and 2 as one element, first element and uh, element connecting nodes 2 and 3 as second element, which is indicated 2 as 2 there in the figure. And uh, also the cross sectional areas are indicated for clarity there. So, now you have element 1 and element 2, you know what is uh, Young's modulus cross sectional area length of element 1. So, you can easily assemble what is the stiffness matrix of element 1. 
or elemental equation system you can assemble. And element 1 if you look, no load is applied in, a, in the region of element 1. And if you look at element 2, all the material properties and cross sectional areas, all the geometrical details and material property details are known to you E A L and also the load that is applied is known. So, you can easily assemble the elemental equations. Equations for element 1, noting down the geometrical properties, material properties, length of that element, we can substitute into this equation that we just derived. And please note that the equation system that we derived is applicable only when cross sectional area Young's modulus are constant throughout the entire cross section, uh, entire length of the uh, sorry, cross area of cross section and Young's modulus are constant over the entire length of the element, since uh, the element that we are looking at is having same Young's modulus and cross sectional area, we can apply these equations, element equations, substituting the corresponding values for this element, we get this equation, element equation. Superscript here is denoting uh, the element for which it is, this equation system is for. Okay. So, now we can also write equations for element 2 and simplification of this gives you this. Equations for element 2, again note down cross sectional area, Young's modulus, length, substitute into the element equations. Again superscript is uh, denoting the element number for which this uh, equation system is applicable. And if you know, uh, see the difference, please note that F is applied, uh, F 2, F 2 here is uh, taken to be equal to 1, because force 1 uh, of uh, uh, 1 uh, kilogram. Uh, for not load, uh, not force, load of 1 kilogram is applied at uh, node 3 and the positive x direction, our positive x direction is growing, going from the, the fixed end to the top. So, the load is acting in the same direction as the positive direction. So, it is taken as 1 and we get the equation system for element 2, which upon simplification gives you this one. So, now you got elemental equations for element 1, elemental equations for element 2. So, now you are ready to uh, assemble the global equation system. Assembly of element equations and please note that this problem is a one dimensional problem and there are three degrees of freedom, one at each node. So, you, uh, you will have a global equation system of size 3 by 3 and the element 1 contribution goes into the location uh, 1 and 2, because the element 1 is connecting nodes 1 and 2 element 2 contribution goes into the locations 2 and 3, because element 2 is connecting nodes 2 and 3. So, that is what is substituted and this is the global equation system. Similarly, the force vector from element 1 goes into the 1 and 2 locations of the global force vector and also from element 2, the contribution goes into 2 and 3 locations of the global force vector. And now, uh, after substituting all this, we get this global equation system. Now, we are ready to apply the essential boundary condition. Essential boundary condition is you evaluated that x is equal to 0 is 0, that is bottom edge is fixed, that is u 1 is equal to 0. 
So, that is substituted u 1 is equal to 0 is substituted and please note that wherever you apply displacement boundary condition, wherever, wherever you apply displacement boundary condition reaction will be developed. So, that is one of the important thing that you need to note down. It is not that because u is 0 that is here u 1 is 0 it is not because of that reaction is developed u 1 you can take any value reaction will be developed. So, uh, since uh, uh, displacement is equal to 0 at node 1 reaction R 1 is assumed to be developed at node 1. And this uh, equation system what you can do is you can use the partitioning of matrices and solve for unknowns u 2, u 3 and then back substitute those unknowns into the first equation and get back calculate what is reaction R 1. Or you can actually multiply uh, or uh, you can actually uh, eliminate the first row of uh, the uh, equation system and you can get this one. And if you do multiplication of this, if you do multiplication of this on the left hand side, it reduces to this one. If you compare this is what is called reduced equation system, if you compare reduced equation system with uh, uh, the equation system that you have without uh, applying the essential boundary conditions. What we basically did is wherever essential boundary condition is applied, remove that particular row and column in the global equation system, then we can get the reduced equation system directly. So, now we can solve these two, uh, 2 by 2 equation system for u 2, u 3 we get this u 2 3. And once we get this u 2 u 3 what we can do is how, how, uh, how do you check whether this u 2 u 3 values are correct or not. What you can do is you can go back and calculate what is R 1 reaction and you know that uh, for a body to be in equilibrium a sum of all forces should be equal to 0. So, substitute this reaction uh, into the free uh, in the in the free body diagram and see whether forces balances or not. Actually in fact, here the reaction is uh, having same magnitude as uh, uh, the load that is applied, 1 kilogram is applied. So, R 1 came out to be minus 1, because it has to balance the positive 1. So, it is negative 1. So, we got what is u 2 u 3. So, what we can do is and u 1 is equal to 0 using these nodal displacement values we can go to each element element 1 we can calculate what is strain stress again element 2 strain and stress if you further want what is the uh, load or uh, what is the load in each uh, axial force in each of the elements, you multiply the stress value with cross sectional area of each element, you get uh, the what is the force carried by each uh, part of the that bar. So, now uh, we solved a problem, we have seen uh, a physical application of uh, the techniques that you learnt. So, now uh, we have seen a, a structural mechanics problem that is axial deformation of a bar and now let us see what is the physical interpretation of this element equations. For axial deformation element shown, suppose uh, we apply forces at nodes such that they produce u 1 is equal to 1, u 2 is equal to 1. You have the axial, def, uh, uh, axial deformation of bar, uh, the equations uh, system is there with you that is E A over L 
1 minus 1 minus 1 1 times u 1 u 2 vector is equal to q l over 2 q l over 2 plus f 1 f 2 vector. You have this equation system with you. So, in that equation system, uh, let us uh, denote uh, the force at node 1 as k 1 1, force at node 1 for unit displacement at node 1 and 0 at the other and at the other node 2 by k 2 1, force at node 2 for unit displacement at node 1 and 0 at the other. So, what is basically done is in the equation system that you already derived u 1 is taken to be 1, u 2 is taken to be 0 and instead of f 1, f 2 ignoring distributed load, the force vector consists of only f 1, f 2, f 1 is uh, denoted as k 1, 1, f 2 is denoted as k 2, 1. Okay? So, this is the equation system you have and now you multiply on the left hand side. If you multiply, if you carry out multiplication on the left hand side that is uh, E A over L 1 minus 1 minus 1 1 times vector 1 0. It turns out that k 1 1 is equal to E A over L k 2 1 is equal to minus E A over L. If you see k 1 1 value k 2 1 value that is nothing but first column of k matrix. Okay. So, now what I will do is, I will take the same equation system except that u 1 will substitute u 1 is equal to 0, u 2 is equal to 1. And let us say corresponding forces, let them be denoted using k 2 1 and k 2 2. Okay. Similarly, forces for producing u 1 is equal to 0, u 2 is equal to 1 and if you carry out the, the multiplication, it turns out that k 1 2, k 2 2 are nothing but whatever values you get are nothing but second column of matrix k. So, what we can learn from here. Column I of stiffness matrix can be obtained by computing forces required to give unit value to degree of freedom at node I, while keeping other degrees of freedom is equal to 0. So, uh, and we can generalize this to a n by n equation system where i j th component of stiffness matrix is nothing but force at a degree of freedom i due to unit value of degree of freedom j or unit uh, value of displacement at j while keeping other displacements equal to 0. So, that is what each component of stiffness matrix is. So, this is a physical interpretation of element equations. And now, uh, let me ask you, uh, we have taken a bar under axial deformation and here we have derived the element equations, but if I replace that bar with a spring having spring constant, how the equation system looks like. Please note that if you see the equation system of the elemental equation system, 
uh, for a uh, bar under axial deformation that we just derived k is e a over l stiffness matrix is e a over l 1 minus 1 minus 1 1 in that e a over l is what is uh, the stiffness is is a, like a stiffness of a spring stiff, stiffness constant of a spring so what we can do is if you want finite element equation of a spring we can easily write it as k times 1 minus 1 minus 1 1 times u 1 u 2 vector is equal to f 1 f 2 f and how the spring looks this is the spring nodes 1 and 2 are defined and spring constants we need to know spring constant. So, if you want to replace a bar element with a spring element what you need to do is you need to find a spring having spring constant is equal to E times A over L of bar element. So, this is a spring element. So, now you learnt what is a bar element and what is a spring element. Now, let us see this example. Find axial forces in spring bar assembly shown in the figure and here units are given in FPS units and corresponding SI units are given in the brackets. And since uh, FP, FPS units are looking uh, in a uh, more uh, without any decimals much decimal points. So, the decimal places will work in FPS units. So, all the uh, the values are given here spring constant length of uh, uh, the bar elements uh, the steel and aluminum and force that is applied Young's modulus cross sectional areas all are given here and a figure is also shown with all the degrees of freedom u 1, u 2, u 3. Please note that u 1, u, u 1 and u 3 are fixed that is u 1, u 3 uh, values will be equal to 0, they are the essential boundary condition and the natural boundary condition is force f applied on the rigid bar is equal to uh, 15,000 15, pounds. And here uh, the force f is applied in the middle of the rigid bar. When you are assembling the elemental equation system this f you can uh, when you are assembling this uh, spring element you can uh, actually uh, put it for contribution for spring element or steel or aluminum bar, but it is acting at uh, this node 2. So, that is what you are going to see here equations for spring element, spring element stiffness uh, matrix is k times 1 minus 1 minus 1 1. So, you find what is the spring uh, constant for spring element substitute that you get this equation system. Here if you see spring element at node 2 this force 15000 pounds is acting that is why this is uh, shown as a contribution to the spring element. And for steel, steel bar element equation system you know what is Young's modulus of steel it is given area of cross sectional area of cross section of steel bar length of steel bar. So, using that information you can find stiffness matrix and the force here uh, this is what I mentioned the force is actually the force contribution is added to the spring element that is why it is not shown here for steel bar element. Similarly, equations for aluminum bar element can also be assembled. 
taking the value of cross sectional area of aluminum bar, Young's modulus of aluminum bar and length of aluminum bar. So, now you have the elemental equations for all the three kinds of uh, components here. So, now you are ready to assemble the global equation system. Spring contribution goes into rows 1 and 2, rows and columns 1 and 2 and steel bar element contribution goes into the location 2 and 3 and aluminum bar contribution also go into location 2 and 3 and the force is applied at node 2. So, that is what is shown there and u 1 is equal to 0, u 2 is u 1 is equal to 0 and u 3 is equal to 0. So, what you can do is you can eliminate rows and columns corresponding to the degrees of freedom which are equal to 0 that is eliminate rows and columns 1 and 3. So, you will be left with uh, one equation one unknown and you can solve for u 2. And while we did all this, what we did is note that applied load at node 2 was arbitrarily assigned to node 2 of spring element. This is what I mentioned. However, this does, does not mean that all this load is taken up by spring element. It can be assigned to either steel or aluminum bar. The only thing that is important is it should be should it should appear the global equations corresponding to u 2. So, this is what we have done. So, applying the essential boundary conditions u 1 is equal to 0, u 3 is equal to 0, the global equations incorporating these boundary conditions becomes this and reduced equation system. You will have only one unknown u 2 which can be obtained solving the second equations which gives u 2 is equal to this. And now you know what is u 2, you can calculate the reactions r 1 and r 3. Please note that if you sum up all the forces that is force applied 15 1000 pounds and plus R 1 plus R 3 should be equal to 0 for force equilibrium. So, now you got all the nodal displacement values, you can calculate the forces. Once displacements are known, strains and stresses can be calculated using element equations. First one is spring force, spring force is what? U 1 is already 0, U 2 is what you just found. So, spring force is going to be stiffness times u 2, it gives you the spring force, both F P S units corresponding uh, S I units are shown and also as expected, it turns out this value is positive, positive means tension, negative means compression that is a, our sign convention. So, positive means tension. So, uh, it, it actually makes sense because the force is trying to pull the spring and what is the strain in steel bar? Stress in steel bar and here strain is uh, negative, negative means uh, stress uh, whatever value uh, is calculated that is compression, axial force is compression. Similarly, aluminum bar, aluminum bar strain, stress, here uh, uh, negative sign is missing, sorry about it and this is uh, expected that is uh, steel bar and aluminum bar will be in compression and spring will be in tension because force is acting uh, from uh, the left side towards right side. Since the spring is towards right, 
and the aluminum and steel bars are towards left, aluminum bar and steel bar will be in compression whereas, spring will be in tension. Okay, we will continue in the next class.